Hello, everyone. Um, with great pleasure, I invite you all in this panel about fintech in Asia at our Horasis Asia Meet 2020. I have a great panel with me of accomplished speakers who will introduce themselves uh, as we go along. Uh, first of all, uh, fintech can mean uh, different things for different people. Uh, depends where you are. Um, whether it's building uh, payment solutions, remittances, arranging finances or other technology in financial areas. Uh, I'm, uh, to introduce myself, I'm a technologist. I spent my entire career looking for technology, making lives better and future of uh, financial services. Uh, in this event, though, uh, yeah, we are affected by the pandemic, but at the same time, technology is enabling us to have this event as well. So my panelists uh, will introduce themselves. So we have Peter uh, from Myanmar, uh, Kimball, Australia, and uh, uh, Tom from Singapore, and Mr. Sandhu Bhaskar from India and US, actually. Uh, Mr. Shachandra will join us shortly. Uh, before we begin, I just had to kind of say this uh, one liner, like whether it's like uh, any uh, solution in payments, lending, robo automation. Now we have all the systems that um, banks, if they really want, they don't need to look into any quarterly statements, but uh, we have the live view of companies' financial health also available. There are thousands of things happening in each of these areas and uh, the panelists with me will uh, kind of uh, guide you with whatever uh, accomplishments they have in their individual talks. Mm, and we will take some open questions at the end, uh, maybe uh, perhaps each after each speaker or uh, towards the very end of it. Without taking any further time, um, I will give it to our first speaker and we begin with Peter. Peter, would you like to introduce yourself and lead us next? Yes, thank you very much, Amandeep. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Brimble, and I'm the Senior Technical Advisor at the Dana Facility, which is a, a project designed to promote private sector development in Myanmar. Uh, I've been working here now on this project for about four years, and we have really carried out a range of activities from agribusiness to financial services. Under the financial services Part of our work, we had learned from a previous project that carried out a fintech challenge in Vietnam, uh, which was really successful, actually, attracted many, many, many fintechs to Vietnam, both from within Vietnam and from abroad. And so we put together a project called the Fintech Challenge Myanmar 2020. Um, the heading of the talk is FinTech is developing rapidly in Asia despite COVID-19. I think our experience to date has been actually that FinTech is really generating a lot of interest in Myanmar precisely because of, of COVID-19. And I think we've been at the same time lucky uh, and at the same time challenged by the impact of, of COVID-19 on our FinTech Challenge Myanmar. The basic idea that we started out with was to create a platform to develop collaboration between FinTechs and local financial institutions, which probably are generally underdeveloped. We aim to apply or to um, create a, an ecosystem where Problems could be solved using innovative technology in a range of areas. And we wanted to look at developing a network of fintechs in, in Myanmar. In the Fintech Challenge Myanmar, we had about, let's say, almost 85 applicants, uh, about 20 from Myanmar and the rest from all different countries around the world. India actually very well represented. A lot of Indian fintechs. Um, applied in Vietnam, and we tapped into the same batch of them. Really fascinating. EKYC groups, uh, digital and financial literacy, digital remittances, uh, alternative lending technologies, micro-insurance, 
uh, cash transfers, EKYC, uh, green finance, a range of different activities. We shortlisted 25, and since early this year, we've been working with those 25 to um, to help them uh, find partners, uh, especially among financial institutions, and also to try to create a dialogue between those fintechs and some dynamism in the fintech ecosystem here in Myanmar. Uh, as a part of the program, we carried out seven eventually deep webinars on those key topics to identify policy issues, to identify challenges, to identify next steps. And we really came up with, uh, I think, a tremendous set of information from both the matching exercises and the um, webinars on policy areas, the need for some kind of flexibility among the policy makers, the regulators, the central bank, the Ministry of Finance, the need for some kind of a um, some kind of a uh, sandbox, uh, so that different products can be tested in a safe environment. Although, actually, in Myanmar, sandboxes were generally used to dispose of bombs and mines, so the use of the word sandbox doesn't always work very well. Um, we found a lot of local players, the challenges uh, to realizing the benefits in these areas were great, but also the enthusiasm. And just a couple of weeks ago, we had a session where 20 fintechs came, pitched their products, tremendously interesting. And we see in this COVID situation, the, the need for digital services, the need for improved um, capacities of the banks and mi microfinance institutions, insurers, uh, really tremendous. Um, as we go forward, we are thinking very seriously to uh, work to strengthen the business environment for fintechs. We will support uh, the development of an innovation hub, which would facilitate dialogue between the regulators and in the fintech challenge, our key government sponsors are the two main regulators, the Central Bank of Myanmar and the Financial Regulatory Department. So we want to support uh, pilot testing and sandboxing for fintech products. We plan to create some sort of an association, a dialogue of dialogue mechanism and platform for fintechs, and we already have strong interest in that. Um, and we want to continue to support some uh, ongoing knowledge and um, uh, knowledge and research capacity to strengthen uh, capacities here in Myanmar and fintech. So trem tremendous possible future, a lot of potential. Thank you. Th thanks, Peter. Uh, I had uh, one uh, question here, like, uh, since there's a kind of a consistent innovation, as you put it, and how does this infrastructure that you laid down is uh, allowing for the region to continue uh, adopt the the trends which will come down in the future. Do you have any words for that? Something to say about that? You mean in ASEAN? Yes. Yes. A um, couple of things. Um, I think Myanmar is a bit behind other countries in ASEAN right now in terms of uh, fintech activity. Certainly we've worked in Vietnam, Singapore. There are tremendous networks already existing in those countries, associations of fintechs. And through ASEAN, uh, we plan uh, to link in the activities here with the activities that are going on in other countries in, uh, in ASEAN, both with a view to uh, stimulating dialogue between the fintechs, but also uh, demonstrating to the Myanmar policymakers what other countries are doing in that space and how uh, we can you know, we can stimulate enthusiasm here. At the beginning of the FinTech Challenge Myanmar, the people at the central bank mm. felt so stressed out by doing so many other activities, setting up payment systems and stuff. They weren't really thinking about uh, FinTech very much. But now they've become more interested, and hopefully that will be stimulated, and the regional dynamism will, will come into, into Myanmar. 
Interesting. Sounds pretty interesting. I will come back to you with uh, more questions and maybe all put together. Uh, sure. Thanks once again. Um, next, uh, we have Mr. Sindhu Bhaskar. And yeah, yeah the stage is yours. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The virtual stage is Thank yours. Thank you, yes. yeah. yeah. Hello and good morning to everyone. Financial industry is uh, very well known to us for all its slippages. Even though COVID-19 could stop all the economic world, but the march of fintech has been continuous and it has been growing and developing in, at least in most parts of Asia, Europe, and even US is now awakening to it. However, uh, we have traditionally been viewed in Asia as Asia as the sleeping giant, but uh, when we combine it with the African continent, then this Afro-Asian block is a huge uh, uh, like block of humanity. And to service this magnitude of people during COVID times has been a Herculean task. And we did come up with, in, uh, with flying colors to meet the challenge. And I am going to give you my personal experience how we are doing and what we are doing in India to start with and in other parts of world. So just to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Sindhu, the co-chairman and founder of EST group of companies. We are based at Cambridge Innovation Center, MIT Boston, and I'm basically a banker for the last 33 years. Globally, we have 16 offices. Our banking licenses are applied for in different uh, continents because the main purpose is to connect all these banks in different part of world by our native blockchain which is called EST Lite and this is interoperable with all different kinds of blockchains why we are trying to have blockchain in our banking setup as part of the core banking uh, because of five main features which are distributed database Number two is peer-to-peer -peer transmission, then transparency with pseudonymity. Fourth is irreversibility irre uh, irre of records. And finally, computational logic. Due to these reasons, we are using uh, blockchain for lending, wealth management, account opening, and trade settlement so that the basic purpose is that those data which are going to be used by uh, different people, different agencies or different institutions, those are on blockchain so that it can be distributed and uh, like everyone can have access to it and no one can independently modify or change it. And we should have at most transparency. <clears throat> During the lockdowns due to COVID, when sky was again blue, birds and animals again tried to take their place under the sun without our clim uh, climatically destructive presence, nature healed herself. Such was our benign absence from economic activities. It was also the time to make more fintech experiments. It is only a placid water which will show more ripples if we throw a stone in that. Otherwise, if world would have been very active and hyperactive with all these, um, um, uh, say, fintech um, activities, we would not have been able to really see the real progress uh, of fintech. So with all, everything, all avenues and all doors closed, it was very easy for us to experiment and get concrete results and see real quantitative developments. Banking as a system is still elitist and has to be converted to include financial inclusion, growth agenda and creation of domestic saving in unbanked areas. These are the real engines of growth for national economy. The fusion of fintech and classical banking principles create a new composite entity, giving out a new axiom, a new mantra of holistic development wherein all the various strata of society interact and integrate uh, with each other and this comprehensive banking gives birth to a new development model to include financial inclusion banking transparency 
and corporatization of rural economy. Records are data and data interplay can remove geographical, economic and social obstacles to development. Now, I take you to a small journey in India where we married technologies to banking and finance and underdeveloped rural areas to create the foundation for an integrated development with financial inclusion. For two years, we have been working with different verticals like uh, we had uh, 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 micro info microfin, which was taking care of microcredit loans to S uh, MSMEs and uh, 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 different labor class. Then we had student loan uh, vertical. The third vertical was uh, Tramo, which was direct money transfer vertical. Uh, the fourth vertical was uh, a cashless bazaar, which was a barter system. So during the COVID, what we thought of that, OK, now we have substantial say uh, client base, uh, nearly 7 million client base, uh, 9000 agents. So what we did, we tried to bring all of them together and we created a new entity called BranchX, which is the neo banking. So in that is the first neo bank which has all the facilities of a proper bank till now with fintech and neo banking and disruptive banking and all those terms were fanciful terms that have been used they are basically uh, uh, meaning uh, payment gateways fund transfer as if those are the only work of a bank bank has to have all the development ethic and ethos to be the real engine for growth and development in the economy and society. So that is the whole agenda which we have tried to create with our digital banking system and neo bank branches. And for creation of all that, we had a four prong strategy. We started with capital aggregation, wherein we try to bring in all the funding agencies uh, to a connected platform so that they can their funds can be used for different uh, lending activities. Then there was capital utilization, capital replenishment and creation of a marketplace. Ultimately, what was happening with this when we have achieved now all these four uh, pillars, we are now moving to the final uh, uh, level of rural exchange because the whole concept of uh, development and sustained development uh, till now has been that the area can develop government will give in money there will be foreign contributions donations subsidies and all that but there is no uh, uh, machinery which can create capital churn out more capital add to it and uh, uh, there is a durable capital for uh, local people. So that was our uh, basic intention to create that machinery for creation and churning of the capital for enhancement of the capital with people, because that can only create the uh, ultimate development and ultimate empowerment of people. And it can come only through financial inclusion, wherein we have to plug them to the uh, national banking system, national economic system, because when we are doing the corporatization of rural economy and commodification of agricultural uh, activities, we are creating capital there. And that durable capital will create domestic saving and domestic saving is a very important constituent of any national economy. And our guru and solution for all this activity is we call it IDEA, AIDIA, Artificial Intelligence for Decentralized Investment Application. The real brain based on blockchain, supply chain management, settlement system, food chain management, inventory management, fully AI backed processing and data center for us. So this is how we have uh, uh, with our first hand experience and moving in the countryside and in the fields, we have tried to develop it. And on the same model, now we have taken it to Africa, wherein we have joined hands with EcoBank, 
and we are providing them all such digital uh, support system so that uh, for all their Af uh, African and South African branches. And now we are finalizing the terms of our agreement with uh, Department of Industry and Agriculture with the Government of Philippines. And we are giving them uh, our rural development farmers blockchain, which is also integrated model with rural uh, banks and cooperative banks. Thank uh, you. Thanks, Dr. Vaskar. I think I'll, I'll, I'll come back with some questions on uh, when we do a yeah. bank. There's a question with the branding and the association. We'll, sure. If we get time, we'll visit that uh, part. Uh, yeah. Thanks for now. Uh, yes, um, and we are a bit short of the schedule. And uh, without further delay, I'll pass to Mr. Shachendra. Uh, please, sir, please introduce yourself, and uh, then the virtual stage is yours. And we'll come back yeah. with questions after. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thanks, Amandeep. Uh, I'm Shachin Rath. I'm founder and chairman of Ugro, uh, Ugro Capital, which I founded in 2018. Uh, we look at, uh, we are trying to solve the, what we call, our mission is to solve the unsolved, the credit problem for a small business in India. Uh, and we are looking at uh, in the combination of what we say, capital plus technology, uh, because if you, as you know, that there is roughly around $350 billion credit gap for small businesses in India. And historically, this credit gap have not been filled by the mainline lenders, um, because this is a very highly non-homogeneous sector. India's SME operate within 180 sectors and roughly around 550 plus subsectors. The way we define it is the problem with the I main lenders have that if you look at a dentist or an eye clinic or a K-12 school or an engineering college uh, or a small chemical factory or a nursing home, these are very different business. But main lenders look at them in a very you know, straight jacketed manner. We have tried solving that problem is first building a very large capital base. So we raised around $150 million capital in 2018. Uh, in a listed company which I acquired. Uh, then we build a deep data analytics and technology platform. Our data analytics platform look at the public source data, which is the bureau uh, and the banking and the GST data. And then we build proprietary underwriting platforms, uh, which takes care of every subsector. Uh, so that without actually going and training thousands of people, when a customer is entering, uh, we can solve the problem. We can pre-customize the credit platform uh, for a particular subsegment of the customer. And obviously, on that top of that, we build a very large and distributed, uh, you know, distribution system. Uh, we look at uh, entry of MSME customer to us uh, from multiple channels. So we have a large branch-led intermediate channel through which we have now nine location going to hundred plus location by next year. Uh, we also focus uh, very deeply on cash flow based financing. As you know, the India stack for, you know, uh, the digitization uh, of financial services or fintech in India is far ahead in any part, uh, in comparison to any part of the world. Uh, you know, we have the India's world's largest bio biometric uh, you know, individual recognition system. And some of that uh, and payment platforms in India have been uh, very, very successful, very large. Uh, and government have been pushing very hard to build digitization for a small business financing. Uh, a few examples of that is, you know, we are the first partner to uh, the world's largest uh, digitized procurement system, which government has built, which is called GEM. Uh, and there is a platform which is called GEM Sahai, which is on tap financing for the SME vendors. We just integrated to that. There is a new concept of account aggregation, which is a layer of, of a new kind of financial intermediaries, which can provide information to financial institution is now licensed and coming on play. We have already integrated with that. So that's largely we are doing our, you know, we think that the only way to solve for this problem of credit is to combine the traditional knowledge of underwriting uh, and make customize it by doing a smart technological solution by data analytics uh, and obviously there is a lot of front end which you can which you can create lending is is uh, is a business and especially if you are a principal lender of balance sheet which we are uh, then you cannot wish away the the uh, 
the knowledge base which has got created by in many number of years uh, in the traditional lending format so you have to take the best of that and but you have to use that uh, you know in in by you know, adapting to that to the new world of of digitization technology and data analytics that's what we do we have a, now a book of around 175 million dollar we have serviced almost uh, uh, 15000 customers uh, pre pandemic and post pandemic actually the you know the covid period has been very help, helpful in terms of achieving our mission of 100% digitization during this period we have you know completed all our digitization project we have gone completely contactless and now we are growing back to the you know fab levels and we are you know we are seeing you know future to be bright in fy21 hopefully we have a vaccine absolutely uh, thanks uh, shachandra and i think there are a couple of questions there but we'll take them a uh, bit later mm. yeah i just tried kept very short so that you get your time <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> many thanks yeah and uh, next we have is uh, kim uh, kim the virtual stage is yours uh, yeah thank Let's you take it from here yes thanks yeah and and i'll try and help you catch up a little bit of time as well um there was a discussion earlier about who was the least qualified to talk about fintech and i think i'm going to prove uh peter that i i win um uh we've got a business uh, nova finance group uh we provide uh, sme trade finance we've been doing that for about 18 years started with one as i said earlier we started with one client and built it from there um we don't we've had a few issues with with fintech and come across circumstances and platforms where there's a little bit too much tech and not enough fin which is why I why I smiled uh when the previous speaker said you can't wish away traditional knowledge I think that's uh that's a very salient point um and fintech means a lot of different things to different people and I mean if you touched on that at at the, at the beginning it can be to some people trading shares or managing retirement portfolios to financial transactions payment payment platforms so when we talk about fintech uh you can have 12 people in a room and get 13 different points of view um we obviously despite what i just said we do use technology in our uh, in our business all our clients have 24/7 access to on online platforms uh we have done a fair bit of work uh, up until 12 months ago on trying to find a way to use non-financial data to credit underwrite um our our primary credit risk because about 80% of what we do is factoring or 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 um financing receivables our primary credit risk is not a client so we don't have access to their uh their credit files or their financial data uh we didn't find that uh, successful but uh technology is being interfaced into our operation uh the, the comment made earlier about biometric uh, id checking in in india is interesting that's something we're interfacing into our platform um and we're also interfacing with our larger clients uh 24/7 real time uh, interface with the uh accounting software uh which is going to be uh, uh a significant benefit for, for them and for us reduce the uh, data data uh, entry data transfer um and as much as possible come completely uh paperless um apart from that I'd like to uh, just leave it open to questions uh, later on uh, I've I don't have a lot of lot to say about uh 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 you know the, the comment about despite covid uh you know fintech has has developed in in uh in asian asian uh, nations i think it's fair to say that uh there is a a larger application for fintech broadly in economies that are underbanked and australia is very well banked all of our clients bar one which is headquartered in singapore our Australian clients we've got a well developed banking system there'd be very very few adults if any in Australia that don't have a bank account where some of the economies around asian would have the majority of their population not having bank accounts but a lot of them do have mobile phones so the opportunities for a wide range of fintech solutions is significant in Australia far less so uh and in our in our business uh we work a lot on a, a very hands-on approach and what makes commercial sense going back to what the previous speaker said you can't wish away traditional knowledge um so we look at every transaction on the basis of does this make sense 
that's not something that can necessarily be put into a one size fits all fintech solution. But it does create the financial op opportunity for us to assist a number of SMEs that are otherwise unbankable in our economy. So with that, I'm happy to hand it back to you, Deep, and happy to answer any questions later. I hope I've caught you up a couple of minutes. Yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs> thanks, Kim. Yeah, I think there's one question. Like You have a very similar model as Shachindra, so maybe we, we'll come back to this. Uh, uh, Shachindra, there's a question for you and for others also in the chat. Uh, but first, now we head to Tom. Tom, uh, virtual stage is yours. Let's listen from you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Dr. Tom Lulesher. I'm Swiss, living in Singapore and working in Asia for a number of years by now. I have been always very active in the financial industry where I was a uh, C-level for insurance companies for most of my uh, career. I've been a tech investor, entrepreneur and advisor now for the past couple of years. And I'm on DP asked me to share a bit the bigger picture about how is the fintech uh, landscape in Asia in Europe, is it that much different? And I think your thesis was uh, you living as an Asian in Europe, me <laughs> living as a European in Asia. I think we had a very good talk before uh, this panel today, and I'm very happy to share here a few of my insights. To compare, it's always important for me to see who are the customers. And seeing uh, the customer segments, we have heard that today already there are three big groups. The first one is the banked. Then the second one is the underbanked and the third one is the not banked or unbanked group of customers and we have heard for all three categories today already a few examples um, looking first at the banked uh, in Europe as well as in Asia you see you have some countries with high or higher income uh, in the average uh, also turnover for the small businesses is a good indicator whether you are in a, in a banked economy or in an underbanked and the SME clearly uh, tends then to be at the tipping point between uh, turnover falling into the bank or in the underbank, depending on how big they are, what's the business that they are in. And so there are the same uh, questions in Europe as well as in, in Asia for this. Generally for the bank one, you can say you have a client group that is already today served. So they have access to credit, they have access to payment, they have access to remittance. And the run is basically currently for surfing them more digitally. You see multi-billion digital transformation uh, projects and initiatives going on in the industry. You see mainly that the traditional players, the bank, they are heavily investing into this and they're also doing a lot of partnering. And as we have heard today about the SME credit uh, rating, which is always a very delicate uh, work to do if you want to earn money. <laughs> you see a lot that uh, startups, they try they fail or they succeed and if they succeed then a bank either partners or even acquires that startup so that's a pattern that we see across the industry in Europe as well as uh, in Asia. Clearly what uh, we have seen now with the COVID situation is that digital savvy players they will uh, gain market share and uh, particularly the lockdowns that we have seen this year for six months or longer in some uh, countries. This was the proof of the pudding and the reality check. Where are you as an established player when it comes to digitizing your products? Because you can only sell digital services and products that are digitized. And if you have not yet fully digitized or end-to-end -end digitized the main part of your offering, then clearly you were struggling over the past couple of months. And we have seen a lot uh, of shift from, of course, the physical branch into the call centers, but call centers were so massively flooded uh, with works and calls by customers that you could even see then a bigger shift from the call center into the purely digital channels because simply people were not keen on waiting hours and hours in, in the call center. So there was really a strong push from COVID into uh, driving uh, the offering to the digital channels, but only, of course, only if you were there. In uh, Europe and in Asia, there are two different types of of sub-regions, I would say. You have on the one hand, you have uh, the ones with this uh, higher and um, higher average income and turnover. And on the other hand, you have still some regions that are clearly um, underbanked and the underbanked regions, uh, particularly in Southeast Asia or in South Asia, as we have heard also today, I think there was a study last year indicating that alone in Southeast Asia, 70% uh, 
uh, of the population is still not having a bank account. And so we see there this is a great potential. But even in Europe, where uh, very often the idea is everyone has a bank account in Europe, the uh, landscape is not that um, uh, that identical when you have a look at the sub-regions, because in the sub-regions in Europe, you have particularly in the South Caucasus or in Central Europe, you still have a lot of underbanked um, clients that still need to be tapped. And why are they underbanked? We have heard today uh, a lot about technology. So technology is clearly um, the question about accessibility to the underbank when you bring in new technologies, exponential technologies, particularly big data, machine learning. You come up with a model that is simply better and it works to pick out of some challenging credit risks, the good ones that you want to provide credit for. And so technology can clearly help strongly to overcome this accessibility challenge. Uh, the second one, which is also an interesting one, is more about trust. Because you see that in many um, countries where there is not a trusted relationship in the established players because people just don't trust the bank or uh, the payment company, then also the technology enabled new players that come in that come more from the e-commerce side where you have a trusted relationship because you handle your own business or at least what you buy as a consumer uh, over e-commerce platforms. And if you have that trusted relationship that it works, very often you're also open to buy uh, or use financial services, digital financial services that are offered through this. So bring us finally to the last uh, ones, the unbanked. I would say the unbanked are in uh, Europe and also in Asia, the most challenging ones, because if you are uh, completely unbanked, very often it means you don't have access yet to the mobile internet. And today we have seen that most of the um, new financial service technologies, they go through the mobile channel and for the unbanked, uh, there clearly needs a push. It needs a push on the one hand from governments that they are making particular digital payments uh, as the lifeblood acceptable in that respective country. If you have digital payments once established, then it's much, much easier to roll out other digital services like credit remittance and so on, and uh, insurance risk protection. And that's something where usually, if it doesn't exist yet, you really need to go into the space, push for e-wallet adoption rate, uh, their telecom Providers play often an important role because if you are living in a in a country where data is very expensive, mobile phone data, um, mobile phone data, then you need to go and finally make sure that you have this accessibility. So wrapping this all up, what did COVID do? COVID uh, clearly did result in a massive push. There was uh, earlier this month a report published by uh, Google and Timosek in cooperation with Bain. And they have identified for Southeast Asia alone 40 million new first-time internet users this year. This is massive. This is the biggest growth in the past uh, five years. Usually it was probably a growth of 10 million a year. Now 40 million. This shows what COVID did. There was this push. And uh, very interesting, it's sticking. So nine out of 10 of these new internet uh, service and digital service users are said, I'm going to stay uh, to this even once we have the vaccine and we are back to normal. Uh, the adoption rate clearly benefited greatly from this. And I would say that's something we have seen now in the past couple of months, which is pretty much uh, unprecedented. And it was a massive shift, of course, for the ones that previously were just trying to go digital but haven't completed it yet. And uh, Definitely in the race between the traditional players and the tech fin platforms, particularly that enter the space from the consumer and small business tech platform side. There you can clearly see that the race is now very tight. And uh, the proof of the pudding, again, was really in the moment when all the branches are closed. Your call centers are up to max capacity and then see where are you? Can you still do business and can you help people to go through the crisis? Wow. Uh, th thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, I actually read that report, uh, Google Temasek report, and uh, there was a pretty interesting insights. So one was like a 34% jump in adoption just to order food digitally. Uh, actually, we, we don't have time for all the questions, but probably one I would like uh, to take for Shachindra and it's a, it's a kind of a brag if you want to do. Uh, mm -hmm. What kind of a data points are like, if you can tell briefly, like you have... Uh, to make credit decisions beyond what is submitted in the application. Uh, yeah, 
so quickly like yeah. in a minute yeah yes absolutely so for small businesses in india as i said that there is uh, there is a uh, tech stack which is which is coming up which is very unique uh, we rely very large portion of the, the data set which is coming out of the gst uh, which is uh, the say, you know the tax data which uh, on the turnover uh and gst is integrating the small businesses and making them transparent in a way which is uh, which has which is unseen before uh and you know we are using the data analytics to look at a, you know so if there is a customer who is selling go- goods or services uh if you look at their gst you can actually pull that information and do a very very sharp analysis of the quality of his sales quality of his receipt uh the geographical presence which we have got and then we add that with the banking data so once you take uh, the banking statement of a customer and combine and triangulate that within the gst and banking actually you can do a virtual profiling of a customer and give you know allow you to come to a very quick underwriting decision making whether the customer is eligible for a loan and to what extent he can service that loan uh, and some of this is coming through a public infrastructure layer which we t- i talked about which is account aggregation uh and uh, you know accessibility of the gst data through otp method and so on and so forth so i'll keep it short but these are two things uh and, and yeah, i think you put in the chat and how you know our model and over cash flow model is similar or dissimilar actually it is quite similar uh, as i said that we look at four different distinct distribution channels supply chain financing being one of them out of the total 300 billion dollar credit gap 100 billion dollar actually is part of the supply chain finance and that also we use the same the method and technology to build cash flow financing uh, through supply chain or trade finance thanks <laughs> thanks for the quick update on that um i i just have to say one thing peter we can't can't take this question but uh, we do recognize i think the kind of invisible hand and in, uh, that you are providing in uh, bringing the undeveloped areas to life to in terms of finance and tech we can't take this question but just want to acknowledge you for that um otherwise yes there's a big difference taking place around us in all the mindset culture and uh, covid has not brought down this thing in asia yet uh, or is rather we have accelerated towards a, a more positive side uh, i have been extremely grateful talking to all of you and uh, this is the time we call it uh, a goodbye uh, thanks a lot i would like to thank you all and conclude this session recording will be available and we'll catch up later as as well after this yeah thank you thank, thank you. you thank you amandeep thank, thank you, you. thanks bye, bye.